indigenous person. And I have um, dark hair and brown eyes. And I am, uh, my hair is up and I have bangs and I am wearing uh, white headsets with a microphone. And I am currently also wearing a, I'm not just wearing a microphone. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm also wearing a, a flowered black top uh, with a, is it pink roses? Uh, so yeah. Nice. It's so good to see you. It is awesome to see you. I just it is awesome to... to be here. I'm just so thrilled. Yeah, and I just want to like for for folks um, that might not know, I I had this really great um, talk with Alice Wong, and she was talking about the importance of naming um, crip friendships and 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 kinships and. Um, you and I have been talking since like 2010. Um, yeah. when a this while. Thing, oh my gosh, a very long time. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to name that, that we've just been so present and giving and generous of your time. And we've had amazing conversations and to do like a conversation this way um, today is very Yeah, special. this is awesome. I am so excited and so proud of you and and all your contributions, you're amazing. And I'm um, reading the book. I just like, I got goosebumps. I got goosebumps, you know, just seeing all the, the power and the beauty and the love, so much love uh, that, that is embodied through everything, the pages, the history, you know, it's just, just gorgeous. And the fact that, that you put, you brought it all together, you know, it's just, it's amazing how time flies and here it is, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you said the word love um, because yeah, this was very much, I mean, you all gave of yourselves, you are part of Sins and Ballad too, and you all gave of yourselves with such love um, that when I sat with everyone's stories, when I was working on this, I felt surrounded in love and wanted this book to be a love letter. I can tell. Yeah, I, I, I can really tell because, you know, uh, to me, Sense and Valid is about love. It's about crip love. It's about loving ourselves enough to let the world know the value of our humanity, mm -hmm. uh, to, to share ourselves fully and wholly, mm -hmm. recognizing our pain as well as our beauty, as well as our survival. Mm -hmm. So definitely Sense and Valid is about love. It's about crip love big time. You know, so for you to have captured it so beautifully, it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, had, it, it took you a, a while to, it's about, uh, you've been working on the actual book. I know that it's, it's been over a year. Oh but my you goodness. and I started conversations, like you said, in 2010, when before the book was even, I believe, like into the horizon of your reality, right? Yeah. You started oh. your dissertation. And that, you know, you reached out to us because you were doing your dissertation and I know that Sins Invalid had, had grabbed you and yeah. shaken your world a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was, I was, so I was very um, centered and clear about my disability, mad identities. I was very clear at that point about my queerness. And so I was looking for a space that honored disabled folks that were queer and were of color. Um, and it was also very clear to me that a lot of the disability studies texts that I was reading were wit written by um, white folks, like all the books that I had access to. And so I really was looking for disabled of color, disabled queer of color history. Um, yeah, and so one of my friends was like, um, Sins and Valid in the San Francisco Bay Area, have you checked them out? And I hadn't, and so I got introduced to your work on my computer in my bedroom one night, and I watched all the performances that were on the website. Oh my gosh. Yeah, just like back to back, and I was just <laughs> like, I, I have to go there. Like, I have, to, I have to have conversations with these amazing humans that are... Um, creating a space that I just thought was aspirational and, you know, couldn't be real. Um, 
Yeah, and so um, I got the nerve to email Patty Byrne. I had to gather like all my anxiety thoughts and like put them aside. <laughs> and Patty was like, "Yeah, let's let's talk." And then that's how I got connected to you and Leroy. Um, and yeah, you said this started as a dissertation. Um, yeah, so this this book was written for that project. Um, and it was very different than, you know, this, this, this is just the, this is just the advanced copy. So it's not centering. The, oh, it looks so beautiful. The beautiful art on the cover, but I wanted to just amplify Ka Yangmi, who does this gorgeous cover. Um, but yeah, it was written in theory and the stories weren't as amplified. And so um, I graduated in 2014. And then in 2016, after a lot of, um, Crip loss and erasure and just really needing to hear Crip stories and dream Crip dreams. I um, opened everything back up and just was like, this has to be a book for everyone. So it has to be written completely in a different way. Um, and yeah, that's, that's when everything started. So definitely written very slow in Crip time. I love that, very slow in Crip time. I can totally understand and relate to that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, and you know, disability justice is what really taught me about crib time. And for folks that might not be familiar with this magic, it's like the idea and the realization that time doesn't function the same for all of us. And, you know, for a lot of people that are disabled or mad or chronically ill or live at the intersection of those things, like, I, I, I wonder if like you've had similar experiences as a writer, Maria, but like I would set the intention to write or to edit or to do interviews or something. Um, and then I would wake up and my depression was amplified or my anxiety was amplified. So even if the intention was there, my body mind was saying not today. Yes. Um, yes, it, it's, it, it can be really challenging. You know, I can absolutely relate to that. Uh, I always like laugh at myself sometimes when I realize, oh my God, I'm doing this because, you know, you would tend to like do say yes to things that, that when we have a lot of spoons in our, in, in our, in our abilities to like, yes, yes I want to do this. And in six months away, it looks like, oh, it's a long time away. <laughs> and then you wake up like, oh my God, it's six months now <laughs> I'm doing this. So yeah, you know, we, I think that as disabled people, a lot of times when, when we have the good days, the days that we have a lot of spoons, the days that we wake yeah. up with energy, we want to do everything. We want to conquer the world, you know, and then disability justice teaches us to actually, it's okay to do things in crypt time, that it's okay to, to be as slow as we may necessarily have to be in order to be efficient, in order to be whole, in order to share ourselves. So yeah, um, I too have learned a lot of amazing lessons through since. Um, yeah. it, it's just, to me, flipping through the, through the virtual pages of your book um, was very personal because I feel like my relationship with Sins Invalid is like family, you know, being a performer and having especially been with Sins performing for them um, since 2007, I feel like I have grown up artistically with Sins as my family. Mm, you know, I feel, I feel like, like this is home to me, you know? So when I was like reading mm -hmm your book and everything is like so oh yeah you know when you're describing uh the performances of, of different people and in my in my mind i'm able to actually go back in time to the memories of backstage to the memories of green room sharing to the memories of after the show you know with all the people that you mentioned and and you know the development of the pieces you know i know kind of like the behind the scenes of of sins you know so it's kind of like it was really personal and really beautiful. And I felt truly honored, you know, to, to, to be part of, of this book, to, to recognize my name, to recognize my pieces, to recognize my, my peers, to recognize, you know, just that I'm part of this amazing movement, you know, to, to be mentioned in a book, even as an author who's published, you know, my own stuff, 
it's so different when somebody else takes you and, and invites you into, into, into the hub of your pages into being an author is like being a mother. It's just, it's like being a parent to something so super special and beautiful. You know, when you held your book up and I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Yes, yes I've been there, you know? You know how it is, you hold that book, that baby, you're like, smell the pages, flip yes. the pages. You're like looking, admiring every detail, kind of like, like, just getting to know it. Hi, you're here. I've known you for however many months. You know? Yeah, no, it, it, yeah. it for sure felt like that. Um, and I mean, I think the really like exciting thing was that this was written very much in community by community because it's not, um, I mean, in a very like, um, like symbolic way all the folks that I spoke to and had a chance to talk with were always with me. Like y'all were always with me in the room. Um, but this is also just a documenting of legacies and histories of crip organizing and love and, and kinship and family making, like you were saying, that I didn't know about. It was like, I was almost filling in the gaps of what queer disabled people of color had done by learning about Sins Invalid, because then I had all of these really um, necessary outgrowths. And like, I learned about Felissa Thompson um, and her writing, um, her website is called Ramp, Ramp Your Voice for folks that um, are interested. And she documents like the history of folks of color in the disability rights movement that I had never heard of, like Johnny Lacey, Brad Lomax. I was like, wow, these are names I'm not familiar with. Um, and Sins Invalid connected me to all of that. So it's almost a documenting of this, I don't know, this larger genealogy that I, I had been searching for, but ha hadn't found yet. Yeah, it's, you know, what you say is so powerful and so, so true, I think, for so many others who um, have come across the work of Sins Invalid with that same realization of like, wow, you know, before I, I, I feel like, okay, I'm sure you've heard of like um, the after Ellen, you know? Like, you know, the, what happened before, what, after Ellen came out is like the after Ellen, you know? So I always say after since. You know, because yes. before sins, to me, that there was no concept of being okay to ask for exactly what we need, mm. you know, and disability justice is about that. It's about being not only okay, but realizing that it's our right to have what we need in order to, to be whole, in order to share our wholeness, in order to function as scripts. <clears throat> so, yeah, I think that a lot of people come to Sins Invalid like you did, you know, I think that with a certain hunger and you weren't sure, you know, you know what you were hungry for, but you know you're starving for something mm -hmm. that would fill you. And I think that that brown, queer, crip energy that before Sins, there was no, you know, I mean, I'm sure we all existed. Brown, queer people have always existed, but we did not have that the platform were to showcase our realities, were to love ourselves proudly and say, hey, this is us and we're showcasing our crippledness. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's the message that I get from your personal experience of how this book came to be. No, I, I appreciate that so much. And I, um, I also, you know how you said it's our political right to say what we need, how we need it, when we need it. I am thinking too about, um, so if, if disability justice is, is new for folks or if you haven't yet gotten a copy of Sins and Valid's Disability Justice Primer, um, definitely do. And one of the things that always stood out to me when I first read that primer was like, oh, it's ask for all of these things and ask for them without, without shame. You know, like you have permission to ask for things that you need without shame. And that was just, that was a very mind blowing um, mm -hmm. 
necessary message um, that I hadn't accessed yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that is that is like so true. I think because of ableism, disabled people, we, we, ha we have been convinced that we are a burden to the world. We have been convinced that we have to like apologize for the things that we need to say, I'm so sorry. Can you please help me? Yeah, you know, and to also idolize non-disabledness. And um, I am such a different crip because of the power of sins invalid. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I was already the goddess on wheels when I came to sins. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, sins gave me the ability to really, really be myself. And not to mention, I, I'm Latina and I grew up Catholic. So there's like double whammy as far as guilt is concerned, you know, being disabled, Latina. It's kind of like, well, I'm supposed to be guilty about everything. And um, disability justice is about loving ourselves enough to recognize that, hey, we deserve it. We occupy a space and we deserve to be here with our crib bodies, with our needs, with our pain, with our scars, with our experiences. We have beauty to offer. We have humanity to, to share. And that the, the things that we do as activists through our art, are life-changing. I think since Invalid is life-changing, it changed my life for sure. And I know it touched yours enough to write a book about it. Yeah, that falls under category of life-changing <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, talking about firsts and um, you mentioned art making and so much of your work is wrapped around stories and telling stories about the body and the experience of the body. And when I was first learning about Sins and Ballad, I was so grateful for how um, art and activism were so intertwined. Like the magic of it is that you can't untangle those things. Um, yes. And, and that was new for me also to see that actually stories and art and, um, how we move our bodies and the performances that that come from that and like for you the poetry that comes from that all of that is activism like we can't separate the two absolutely absolutely yeah just by the very nature of of our existence if, if you're disabled automatically we're fighting for survival you know and um, i think that when you're a disabled artist we're not only fighting for survival but we're utilizing our art as a tool and as a weapon, as a tool to stay alive and as a weapon to defend ourselves from the ableist bullshit that's constantly attacking us and mm -hmm. keeping us down mm -hmm. and throwing us away. So yeah, yeah, there's so much power. Um, art, you know, I really do believe poetic ac advocacy for me personally mm -hmm. and artistic activism are the vein that keep me moving in that direction that keep my advocacy and my muse alive. So to me, is it like amazing and incredible to be able to actually do what I love and do it through Sins Invalid. And I mean, I love Sins so much, you know, besides being my artistic family. I, I mean, I've, I've grown tremendously as a person. I've grown tremendously as an artist. And most importantly, I have, like you, also connected with a lot of other Crips who continue to, to shape and reshape my personal perspective about disability and justice and disability justice. And uh, not to mention friendships, you know, the pandemic did something for us, I think, and for, meaning the world. And, and one of those things is what the realization Mm -hmm. that disabled people, we've been doing this kind of stuff even before the pandemic. We've been surviving, we've been networking, we've been connecting, we've been making shit happen, yes. you know, working from our crib beds. I mean, look at Patty, you know, how she, she, she did Sins Invalid, you know, as a disabled woman with a significant disability, as a brown, queer, disabled woman with, you know, the various intersections of all the shit that should like tie us down and keep us from doing stuff are the very same things that led disabled people like Patty to just say, let's break free 
and collectively move together toward liberation. And, and that has since happened. And I love that so much, you know, so I want to like, thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing your personal muse to put this into writing, you know, to capture this for other disabled people, because it's easy for me to brag about sins, because I feel like I'm so much part of sins because I've been performing and my pieces are so become like part of the history. You know, I can't, you know, all of us, all of us who have very performed for so. sins, yeah. you know, very much so. Leah, Nomi, Leroy, I mean, you name it. Everyone who's been in the shows for the last 14, 15 years have immortalized themselves and sins and what disability justice in the movement is. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, you know, like I say, it's easy for me to brag about sins, you know, because I feel like, the, like this, like, hey, this, this, this is my family. This is my, you know. So when I see, like, like I was saying earlier, to see myself, to see my peers, to see the history of a movement that I'm so much a part of, to see it written and captured by somebody else who witnessed it, you know, through the lens of your own personal existence as, as a disabled person, for you to have taken that, what you witness has since touched you, for you to have done that and turned it into this amazing book of crip kinship. It's just, I'm super grateful and super excited. And by the way, I want a hard copy and I want it signed. I <laughs> because, love it. Because the digital copy is fine and dandy, but I'm freaking old fashioned, baby. I want to smell the pages. <laughs> I am too. Um, okay, well, this is, I guess this was going to be a surprise, but I, I do want to gift all the lovely sins people that helped like a heart, like a copy of the book with a lovely message and all that good stuff. So you'll be getting one soon. Yay. I hope I get my copy soon too. <laughs> it's, um, thank you. I'm very overwhelmed and touched with all the love. Um, I, I think it's very, um, powerful, special when, um, and this is what I'm thinking about in terms of like what story crip of queer of color storytelling can do and what can that art making do. Um, and I'm thinking about how as a viewer um, and as somebody who mostly watched a lot of content at home but was able to go to two performances um, and to see two performances in person live. Um, which one did you go to? So I went to the Crip Soiree, which was, I think, in 2014. Um, it was at the Brava. And then I went to the 2016. Um, oh, the Crip Wisdom? Yeah. The Wasn't that beautiful? Oh, I loved it. I know, right? Oh my gosh, I loved it. And I don't know if like this is a good time to talk about the magic and the necessity and just the medicine of a crip centric liberated zone and like what the show spaces offer. But like it was my first time being in such a um, mixed space with other people that were also disabled, different disabilities um, queer folks, um, you know, folks of color and all of us were there in a space, um, where our needs as much as is possible, um, were being met. Um, like I, I keep repeating this because I think it's so profound, like for the show that I went to, um, there were audio descriptions if you needed them. ASL interpreters if you needed them, roomy, cozy seats for all bodies if you need them. Um, There's a gender neutral restroom. There was a quiet room, which my anxiety brain was like, yes, this is lovely. Um, there were so many aspects of need that were considered and the tickets were on a sliding scale and no one was turned away for a lack of funds. So all the elements of oppression that impact me and so many other folks that I know, I'm thinking of like, you know, ableism, racism, classism, um, uh, you know, cis heteropatriarchy, like all of these things were offered and uh, were intervened rather. Oh, and it was set free, you know? So it was like, wow, the first time you go into a space like this um, where needs are met and considered. Yeah. 
and distanced from any like rhetoric of shame we might have grown up with or ta been taught. Exactly, exactly. And, and now um, it's even more exciting because we're moving into language justice. You know, now we're, we're moving into being trilingual where our future material, as well as some of the older material, we are hoping to incorporate into Spanish language um, translations. Um, so yeah, um, it, is, it is really, really exciting. All the various things always happening with SINs, you know, we're always reaching out to the most marginalized communities within the CRIP community. And that's what makes, I think, uh, the movement so powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the definition that just popped in my head um, from disability justice and just the primer is um, they describe um, disability justice as not like a finite thing that's already been established and, you know, the perimeters have been planned out, um, but they call it a yet to be map, as in it's still growing and expanding as in, um, you know, cross movement solidarity. Hello. <laughs> I just saw, I just saw a, a, someone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, this idea of cross movement organizing, there's always like, there's limitless potential there. Exactly. Um, so I love, I love the language justice work that you're all doing. I, um, like, yeah, the next goal for this is like, yes, an audiobook, a book translated into Spanish. Like, that would be incredible. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. This is so super exciting. Um, so what's next for you? I, I should be interviewing you, not the other way around. This should be like an interview, not a conversation. I have, I have, I have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, what, yeah. What's... I mean, it could... I feel like your interview, like we're having a conversation. <laughs> I, for folks that don't know, like when I reached out to uh, Maria and other folks, like um, I think I, the language I came up with to name what I was looking for, like y'all are conversation partners, you know, like, yeah, no, this is per exactly what's supposed to be happening right now. Um, oh, and somebody wrote, I love that. I have the warm and fuzzies. It's all good. Yeah. I love it. I love it. This yeah. is so cool. So um, after this tour, what, tell me a little bit more about the tour. What, what, who's after me? Um, after you, I'm going to be speaking with Leah. Oh, I love Leah. Yeah, I'm going to speak with Leah. And then December is off. Um, Actually, I think I can be fancy and organized right now and put the link with all the events coming up in the chat. Um, and more are being booked for spring. It's just, this is like, for now, um, I know I'm gonna speak with Patty in the spring. I'm gonna speak with Nomi. Um, yeah, lots of lovely folks. Um, just to, again, just continue to stay as, um honest and true to the community building that that you all do yeah that is so awesome yeah. i am so excited and and just truly just appreciative of this book you know i love it oh i'm so glad oh that that means that means everything because it was it was written for y'all um, and everybody else, but it was so, it was so written to document your work. Um, and uh, I remember from a talk with somebody else, they shared that they want to be generous with the space and they invited other people to ask questions too. So if y'all, if anybody has any questions in our last, like, yeah, know, please. Ten minutes, um, you know, I was wondering, Maria, if you could also share maybe what your next project is, or is there something that you're working on now? Oh my gosh, I am always working on so many things, but uh, right <laughs> now I am uh, focused on um, SINs nice. because, you know, with uh, us going um, Spanish speaking as well, I am, um, I actually, yes, I do have uh, some exciting news. I, 
I am now serving since at a different capacity, in addition to being an ongoing artist, of course. Uh, so I am now, I have accepted a position with them as their Spanish language outreach coordinator. So yeah, yeah, yeah I'm super excited. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I feel like I'm even more part of the family, you know, it's, just, it's, so that's what my focus is right now is um, we're hopefully going to be moving into generating some Spanish language content um, in addition to, to translating stuff. And I'm just like, uh, kind of just kind of like just putting myself out there as Maria who speaks Spanish and, and see, you know, just how, how it goes. Yeah, we just want to share the love uh, with the Spanish speaking world, which has had pretty much zero access to disability justice material, you know, so I feel my responsibility as someone who is Latina and Spanish speaking to, to really commit myself to, to this aspect of the movement, to, to making sure that my brothers and sisters in Latin America and Latinos in the United States learn about what Sense Invalid is about. So that's what I've been working on. In addition to everything else that a goddess does, of course, you know. <laughs> Big, big, huge hearts and congratulations. Um, Thank you. So exciting. Um, and actually, one of my dear friends is in the chat. Hi, Keelan. Keelan has a juicy question for both of us. Um, oh, okay. Do you have advice for young Crip writers how to make a book goal come true? Absolutely. Can I answer first? Please, yes. Okay. Well, the very most first most important advice that I have for young crip writers is just write. Lose the fear, lose the shame, just write. Just, just pour your heart out and don't be afraid of anything. The more you write, the better you'll become. And most importantly, know that what you create is capable of making a difference. It's important. Share your scars through your writing. Share your experiences, put yourself there. Even if nobody reads it, keep writing. The more you write, the stronger your writing becomes and the stronger you become. And as a, as a disabled writer, take advantage of your experiences as a disabled person and really put your experiences together in a way that benefits other crips. In other words, be generous with your lessons. Give yourself a way through your work and through your muse. Oh, I love that so much. Be generous with your lessons. Um, I love that so much. And I, I, think, I think the other thing that comes to mind too is right with your body, mind. Um, I feel like coming from academia and, and writing like, um, we were told to learn and teach and all of those things um, against our body minds and just like pr pretend you don't have a body or uh, you're not a being that feels um, or experiences things like put all that aside and then do the work that you're supposed to do. Um, and so I think writing with our body minds is so important and if our body minds are communicating that it needs to be a day of rest. Um, stepping into that without shame is so important. I did not learn that lesson easily, just putting it out there. Like that was not like a very easy, um, you know, um, capitalist mandate to let go of, but it's, it's possible in community, especially when I share that with others um, who are working similarly. And lastly, like y'all work in community with one another. Um, it's, at least for now, for me, it's logging online in Zoom like this and like writing with other Crips and other disabled folks and friends. And it's um, it's been really, really, really helpful. That's so true. And you know what? I, I have a question for you. I just remembered. It, uh -huh. Since you mentioned that, I, I forget that, that you teach, you know, you're a professor, you're in academia. So how have you presented this book yet to students? What is your plan? Are you planning to utilize this as a tool in your teachings? Um, I feel so, so I've told my students about this and they've been coming to events and just giving me a lot of strength and support when I feel the most anxious um, about doing the work. Um, 
and they've, you know, really, um, a lot of the conversations actually I've had with them got woven into this. So I don't know if I'm going to teach it in class though. I feel so weird about like teaching my own <laughs> book. But what I will say is I've woven in disability justice practices and principles into classroom space. Um, and whether students in that space are disabled or not, everybody always comments on how vitally important it was to our learning space and our community to move in that way um, with no body mind left behind right like so this work not like directly but um, disability justice is always present in the classroom that is awesome yeah i love it Oh, there's a question from Melanie. Ooh, how does one reach goddess level, Maria? <laughs> that's Most an easy, days... that's an easy question. <laughs> yeah, so Melanie says, how does one reach goddess level? Most days I feel like warm temperature, mashed potatoes, thanks to chronic anxiety. <laughs> All the feels with that question. <laughs> well, um, I love the question. Uh, to me, this is just my personal how I think that we reach goddess levels, and that is by loving ourselves. Everything begins and ends with self-love. And I think that when we love ourselves enough, and I say it like the goddess part, you know, people ask me, how did you become a goddess? And I, 20 years ago, I say maybe 30 years ago, I was working in the domestic violence uh, field. And I was working on violence against women every single day. And every single day I would realize how resilient, how powerful, how badass women are, you know? And, and that's like, oh man, women are goddesses. <laughs> that's how everything got started for me. And so you reach goddess levels, you know, go back to your question, reach goddess levels by loving yourself and by sharing the best of yourself continuously so that it flourishes and comes back to you. That is really the secret. When you love yourself enough, then your own goddessy, goddessness, uh, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, shines through. It is just confidence. In one of my sense pieces, I say confidence is sexier than the body. And that's really, really, I, I mean it. Really, goddessness is about confidence and self-love and generosity. Oh, I love that so much. And you made me think, too, about how maybe i don't know if i've reached goddess level but my in my aspirational like journeying <laughs> toward that i feel like a big part of it is persistence like through all of the different um as an anxious person melanie like through all the moments of um like you all can't see this but i'm holding on to like a fidget toy and a stone right now <laughs> um but like through all the through all the different anxieties and external and systemic oppressions, just like fucking persisting. I feel like exactly it's an important part of um, the, the love work that you're talking about. Right yes. Now. Yes. And love work, like you said, it takes time. It takes time because from the time that we're coming to this world, we are labeled, we are oppressed. And I mean, we are forced to, oh God, don't even get me started, but yes. We, we get so used to negativity, you know, self, you know, just deprecation. Like we're like, oh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not good enough. And I think that we just need to keep practicing, 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 loving ourselves through everything that we do. Everything, everything that we do. Yeah. But I know it's not, it's not easy, but it's doable. Yeah, and I love, Keelan wrote this great thing in the chat that's making me think of like the nuance of what goddess might mean. Um, she wrote different than diva because it sounds like what, what we're talking about right now is loving the self, unlearning toxicity, loving the self, and then expanding that outward yes. and being interconnected with others and community. And that's so different than just like one per, being a person yes on, on your own it's more about the interconnectivity that you develop absolutely with. absolutely okay. I, I always think that and there's nothing wrong with being a diva okay because being a diva means that you know your worth being a diva knows that you don't let anybody fuck with you you know i'm a diva um that's fine but being a goddess means that you recognize your worth but then you're 
again, I go back to the to the generosity of that interdependence requires generosity and, and recognition that all of us have the same value and, and that we deserve to, to help one another, you know. Uh, so I, I believe that goddessness versus the diva thing. A goddess is simply that you recognize your worth and you love yourself enough to share it with others. You share yourself with others constantly. You share your talents, your passions, your love, your everything. You know, that reaching goddess levels simply means loving enough. Loving yourself, loving the world, and just giving and receiving constantly. Mm. I love that. Um, and I, I think you're making me think too about how the process of, of writing, um, and then to go back to Keelan's question, crip writing comes from that place of reciprocity and love also. Um, the very last, um, the very, very last line of the book is an offering to you all who are going to be reading it. Um, it says, um, so imagine yourself sitting alongside the questions that have come up for you. What crypt out futures do you want to dream up together? May you, dear one, write the next book and the next as we continue to move toward our collective body-mind liberation. Um, and I think too, like an offering of like slash invitation for all the folks that are here to share their crip wisdom and love and render and remember that these things that you're saying are medicinal for yourself and for your community. And I guess then that's goddess work, right, Maria? Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I I love that. Thank you for saying that. You know, because as much as I mentioned love, I think that I don't mention healing enough. Mm. In healing, we, you know, love heals. And yeah, that, that's so super important. Absolutely. We heal each other and ourselves. Yes. This is so beautiful. The work that we do is healing. Mm -hmm. We have to heal from ableism. We have to heal from the oppression that, that has been imposed upon our lives. We have to heal from all the invisibility. Oh my God, there's so much pain that we have to heal from. There's a lot of forgiveness to do and it has to start by forgiving ourselves. You know, I, I really do believe that because I, I think there's so much guilt mm -hmm. and, and guilt, you know, the thing we liberate ourselves to say, hey, I let go, I forgive myself for, you know, sometimes we, we blame ourselves for shit that's not even our fault. You know, society, ableism has taught us to, to feel guilty and to blame ourselves or somebody for being disabled. You blame God, you blame society, you blame doctors, you blame, you know, you got to blame somebody, you know, we got to let it go. And love is always the right answer, baby. I love that. Love is an exercise of unlearning. Oh and my God, communal, yes. And communal witnessing. I mean, I can't, I'm grateful for everyone who's who's watching this with us and who's going to join in later. But I, what happens with time? It, it's been an hour. <laughs> oh my gosh, has it? Yes. No. Yes. Right. Um, er, isn't it? Hasn't it just been an hour? Um, <laughs> it, it has. Yeah. That oh basically means we've been having a blast, and this has been super easy. You yes. know. Yeah, that, that when time flies is because we've been having fun. Right, that's right. <laughs> Imagine um, if we would have been like this, uh, uh, or it would have been lots of like dead space, <laughs> silence, like, um, mm, what do I ask next? <laughs> yes. Of shit here. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my goodness. So freaking grateful. So, so grateful. So I'm going to pop back up here and remind folks that they can, of course, pre-order Crypt Kinship from Karis. Um, the book officially comes out on December 7th. We're hoping it may ship a little earlier than that. So go ahead and order it via the link in the chat right now if you have not already. Um, support Shada and everyone else's work. Um, we would love, love, love to uh, to have you continue on and continue watching Shada's tour around the country. Um, I'll be adding this to our YouTube channel. So if there are other folks who you think would like to watch this who couldn't join us tonight, 
just know it'll be up in a couple of days. Um, and we're really grateful to everyone for doing the last minute switch over to Zoom. Uh, we know that's inconvenient, but uh, we really did think it was going to give a better experience. So we hope that's been the case for you. Um, thank you so much, Maria, for being with us. It's lovely to, to get to know you a bit. Shada, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to our interpreters. Um, congratulations on this really important book. Yes, congratulations. So I love you. Everybody, please buy the book. Reserve friend. that book. You will not regret it. Thank you all so much. And can I have one last request? Of course. All comfortable with a group photo before we end. Yay. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> all right, let me set Make this sure my up. bangs look perfect. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness, yes, audience. Hello. Yay. I love okay, wait, let me go in gallery. Oh my Yay. goodness. Yeah, okay. I can't express to no one's done this before. Y'all are amazing. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yay. Y'all made my heart so big and happy. Take such good care. Thank you, everybody. This was amazing. Buy the book. Yes. Bye, y'all. Good night. Take care, everyone. Thank you for being here. Night, night.